Welcome everyone. I'm Norman from IFAS. I'm an advisor in IFAS. And today, Dylan and I will be sharing with you about how to build a portfolio with RSP. So, okay, so let me talk about, a little bit about IFAS. Okay, so IFAS, um, basically we are having a strong support, which is having me as a bridge. So any issues that you have faced, encounter, just come to me. I'll be the bridge um, to any investment tool that you need to uh, get into. Okay, so we are all in one platform. So basically we have unit trust, ETF, bonds, and stocks. So mainly for RSP that we are talking about today, we'll mainly strongly talk, uh, talk about DPMS and unit trust. Okay, and we allow great flexibility. So basically you can trade using your mobile phone. You don't have to always be on your laptop or on your desktop. You know, you can just on the go, just um, do your tradings or admin your RSP uh, whenever you want. Okay, and we have 24 seven access. So basically, even if you have any issues, you can just call in the hotline or you can just message me. I will, I will try to reply whenever available. Yeah. Okay. So we'll go to the next slide. Okay. So let me share with you how do you invest. Okay. So basically, we have two types of accounts. The first account is a DIY account and the second account is an advisor assisted account. Okay. So for the DIY account, basically, it's very simple. You just have to download our IGM app. Okay and you just register with my code which is triple zero three seven then after that just message me so my number is nine seven two three seven four eight three just um try to take down now if you don't have my number and i will talk to you about it further later on okay so then there will be two options for rsp whereby you can do dpms which which dylan will be talking about later is about five hundred dollars a month minimum and you can do any fund selection which is on unit trust which usually is $100 minimum, except some is $500 minimum, but majority of them are starting from $100 uh, per month. Okay. Um, and then the next step is just to set up a gyro. So right now you can actually do standing order through your online iBanking, and I will send you the steps to set up this standing order when you are ready to do so. Okay. So for advisor assisted account, it's also um, even simpler. Basically, you just contact me. And I will link out with you to understand what are your needs, your risk tolerance, um, your goals, you know, how much you can invest, you know, what is your uh, income versus your expenses. Then we will discuss accordingly and draft out a portfolio for you. So this particular portfolio can range from any amount. It could be 100, 500, 1000. It really depends on what is comfortable to you. Okay, And then similarly, we will set up the standing order. So sending the order, actually we have a PDF that is for you to go and just follow the instruction. It's pretty much very simple, so no need to worry. Um, basically, the main, most important thing is to take note my number. And if there's anything, just contact me. Drop me a message after this seminar. Okay. Yes. Okay, so this is how the IGM app will look like. Okay, so basically the, this is where you key in a triple zero three seven. Okay, so the RSP actually starts from as low as 0 0.38 per annum. So it's pretty competitive in the current market. Okay, so we have more um, different pricing model for different items. So you can contact me and chat with me about other um, investment vehicles as well. Okay, so now we will invite Dylan to speak about the RSP. Uh, he will be sharing with you about RSP and DPMS. Okay, let's welcome Dylan. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, so this is going to be my presentation today on uh, building your uh, long-term wealth plans with this thing called regular savings plans, which is a short form for RSP. Okay, so uh, I believe we haven't properly introduced ourselves just now. So I'm just going to introduce Norman on his behalf. Okay, so Norman is one of the uh, financial advisors here over at IFAS Global Markets. All right. Uh, he is responsible for maintaining all your relationships and helping you to plan your overall wealth. My name is Dylan. I'm one of the investment consultants assisting advisors like Norman uh, over here at I IFAS Global Markets. So basically, whenever there is a technical issue or you know he has queries on how to better construct your uh, portfolio, he will basically uh, come to me and then we'll work together to see how we can you know potentially plan for your uh, you know your portfolio and your wealth planning purposes. All right. So uh, for, without further ado, let's uh, get on to our topic for today. So today we're going to talk about a regular savings plan. All right. So first off, what is a RSP, right? Okay. So an RSP 
is, uh, or rather a regular savings plan as the name suggests, right? It's a, it's a regular, literally a regular savings plan where you think of it as a monthly subscription plan that forces you to invest uh, kind of like a small sum of money each time into any particular uh, selected uh, investment product. So think of it as like, you know, every month you pay your, your phone bills or your TV bills or, you know, whatever bills, right? All those subscription costs that you pay uh, on a monthly basis. So think of RSPs as something like that. But this time it's not so much of paying for something, but you're actually doing this on a monthly basis in terms of uh, your investments, right? So it's actually something for you, not so much of something that you have to pay for. All right. So the, the, the reason why this is actually good is because as you see my second point here, right, it actually instills a lot of discipline. So, you know, we keep telling ourselves that we need to save, we need to save up, especially during such times, right? But how many of us really have the discipline to do so? So this RSP plan actually comes in to, to kind of insti in, uh, institutionalize this uh, regular savings uh, framework where it kind of makes it a uh, compulsory, in a sense, inverted commas, compulsory, uh, uh, you know, methodology for you to invest regularly, right? Think of it as like CPF as well. All right. So the good thing about it is that you can actually invest in quite a wide range uh, of solutions or products over here with us. All right. So whichever products you might wish to do so, you can always have a conversation with uh, Norman at the end of the day. Right. But we'll introduce uh, the concept to you about RSP first. Okay. So um, another another very common word that we like to use. Uh, uh, to, to describe RSP would be this thing called dollar cost averaging, right? So if you look at these three words, right, uh, dollar cost averaging, what does this mean? So dollar is, you know, in terms of your money, right? And the cost. So think of the cost as each price you pay uh, for each of your investments, right? On a monthly basis, what, what the stock price is, what the share price is, that, that you think of it in terms of, uh, and that, of, of, of that's your cost. And then averaging means uh, when you do it on a long-term basis, right? Whenever prices go up or go down, on a long-term basis, we're trying to basically bring uh, your, your, your entry cost lower. Right. So if you look at this table that I've drawn up uh, over here for illustration purposes, right? if let's say you're looking to buy, let's say for example, uh, uh, ABC stock, all right. So January, the, the stock price of this ABC stock was about $10. So if, if let's say every month you contribute about $100, you look uh, in January, you actually bought 10 units, right? Because $100 divided by the price of $10, you basically bought uh, 10 units. But what happens in the next month in February, if let's say the company does well, the share price goes up to ten fifty, right? But you're still contributing the same amount of $100 uh, investments into the same uh, instrument. But this time, because the price is a little bit higher, so end up you have a little bit uh, less units, 9.52, correct? But then, you know, as things go up and go down, you see as when the price goes down back to 980 in March, right? Uh, with the same amount of $100, you're still uh, uh, better off because in this case, you're actually buying more units than what you have actually uh, experienced before, right? So if you see, if I continue the trend as it goes up and down, up and down, right? The number of units that you will buy will actually vary. So this is just a matter of five months. Can you imagine that if you adopt a long-term investment plan, you know, in a very specialized uh, 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 solution that is on that is an all-encompassing uh, portfolio when you do this for your whole entire holistic portfolio, right? Uh, you can actually imagine that, you know, on the, in the very long term, when prices do recover, when things get better, uh, you know, from now, right? You, you actually do see that net-net your cost, right? Uh, is actually lower than what you initially got in at. So for this example, you see January, originally the price was $10, right? But if things go up and down, up and down, uh, on average, the cost was actually only 986 so the good thing about RSP is that, you know, it literally does a dollar cost averaging uh, methodology for you, regardless of what kind of prices you actually look at, right? So essentially what it does is that you, with the same amount of money that you put in each month, you buy more units when the prices get low and you buy less units when the prices get high. So you don't really care about whether uh, prices go up or down. I mean, you do care, but it's not going to be so much of a concern for you because you already know beforehand, you know, each month you already tell yourself, regardless of the price, I'm just going to put in $100. So in a sense, that's your, your, your monthly uh, contribution, right? So what are the benefits? We've already talked about some of them. The first one is that, you know, a lot of people keep saying that, oh, investing is only for the rich. You need a lot of uh, money to start investing, but actually that's a very bad myth. 
So with as little as, as, as you know, $50 per month, right, you can actually already get started on this uh, investment journey. So uh, what we like to think of is just not the example that I drew up for you, right? It was about $100 per month. So if you think about it, I think 100 out of a normal uh, 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 monthly salary, I, th I, would, I would think that is still quite reasonably fair, right? I mean, thinking about if let's say your, your utility bills or your, your phone bills will cost up to maybe you know, $300 or $400 per month. You know, I would say $100 per month for your own long-term investment benefit is actually quite fair uh, a price to pay, right? So, and, and the good thing about it is that uh, it, it doesn't apply to only those experienced investors. Whether you are a young person starting out in his career or even in university for that matter, or you're already in late, you know, uh, you've been working for quite a while in your later 30s, later 40s or 50s, you can, it's never too late to start investing as long as you do it with the right mindset and you're doing it for the long term, right? So once again, the last point here is that you're going to achieve some potential cost savings because uh, when you do it on a monthly basis and an institutionalized basis, you can actually read a lower transaction costs as well, all right? So the second benefit is that it gives you a very disciplined approach. So we talked about this just now, right? We keep saying that, oh, uh, I'm very stressed about whether the markets are going up or down. But because you already said beforehand, okay, you know what, for the next 12 months or the next 24 months, which is about two years, for example, each month, I'm just going to put in $100, uh, you know, regardless of whether prices are going up or down. So in that sense, you are removing a lot of the emotions when it comes to, do, uh, when it comes to doing investing. Because, you know, in such a volatile uh, time period, especially right now, right? where prices go up and down and people get so nervous about whether things are going to hit for the worst or the better, you know, it, it, I think it's really important to think about uh, investing in a very disciplined approach. So uh, people tend to sell when they're very fearful of the markets, but actually that's the worst time to sell because as Warren Buffett said, you know, you should be greedy when people are fearful and vice versa, right? So once you adopt this disciplined approach to investing, the RSP will actually remove all these emotions out of, uh, 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 you know, your process of investing. So once again, the second point is to buy low and sell high, which is what we want to do, right? We, we, we don't want to do it the opposite way where we actually sell low and buy high, right? So that, that's actually a lot of uh, the pitfalls of a lot of what the emotional investors actually go through. So once again, it's a very disciplined way for you to stay invested. Once again, the importance of this is to stay for it for the long term, right? So you don't want to miss out on any of the opportunities going forward, okay? So this is some of the... Um, uh, uh, back to the same table, right? We see that, you know, if let's say you were following this stock price, uh, when, when the stock price goes from $10 to 1050, you get happier, right? Because, you know, your, 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 your assets are worth a little bit more. But if let's say the stock price goes uh, a little bit deeper and then you start to worry and then you start selling, right? You might potentially be missing out on uh, a lot of further opportunities because no one really knows what's going to happen in the future, right? So RSPs in a way also help you to avoid uh, this phenomenon called market timing because people, when, the, when, when people try to time the market, they're trying to essentially catch the main bottom. But who would have known that, you know, in this example, in the five months of prices that I've shown here, right, who would have known that in May, uh, $9 would have been the lowest price. It may could have easily been ten fifty or $11 or so on and so forth, but no one really knows what uh, could have happened, right? I mean, after all, even this uh, whole virus situation also caught us, caught everyone in the world by surprise. No one could have forecasted it. So, you know, uh, doing an RSP, be it the good times or the bad times, you're still staying disciplined. You're not taking your eye uh, off the ball, which is why uh, it also helps you to avoid market timing. All right. So yeah, so this is an illustration of what happened to the Hong Kong exchange. Uh, I, pu I pulled out the Hang Seng Index, which is a representation of the largest companies in Hong Kong uh, during the period of SARS back in 2003. So you see that, um, you know, uh, back then when, when the first case of SARS was reported in, in, in China, right, no doubt, you know, uh, we were experiencing the same thing. People were selling off because people were scared, right? And then SARS arrived in Hong Kong and people sold off even more. But somewhere around May, in 2003, I think that was when, when, when things started to ease and, and, and the virus started to peak already. And that's where, you know, sentiment got better and things started to recover. And then it was only in somewhere around August that the SARS was officially declared contained. And then that was when we saw a recovery. But you see, right, in the period of, of late uh, November, December 2002, all the way to uh, August 2003, right, you see that this is actually a very long, drawn-out V-shape. Uh, uh, what you call that V-shaped uh, situation, right? So if let's say you had panicked and you had sold 
uh, the moment they first reported the SaaS, right? And then you see as the prices went down, you didn't even invest, right? And then after that, uh, uh, you, when, when things started to go up, then you start to buy again. The kind of upside that you will get uh, from the recovery would have been less. So if you see, if you follow my cursor here, right? If let's say um, you sold over here and then you just let things go down, fine, let it sell, let it sell. And only when, you, when it recovers, then you buy it again at here, right? You would have lost out on this entire, uh, sorry, lost out on this entire uh, portion. So if you follow my cursor again, if I had been invested in an RSP, a regular savings plan, when it keeps going down, I'll keep buying here and here and here and here and here and even here, right? So the moment when, when, when things start to recover, when things start to recover all the way, I'm still continuing to buy, but all these upsides would have actually been gained because I continued to buy even when it was on the dip. So the underlying assumption here, of course, is that you know, things will start to recover uh, in the long term, which is why I keep emphasizing that you know, when we invest, we can't invest for just a cost of six months, right? Because if people can do that, basically they're saying that they can really time the market and no one really has a crystal ball, which is why we don't uh, advocate doing that, right? So this is how uh, a real life example can actually be used to illustrate the benefits of being uh, invested in an RSP program, all right? So this is also another illustration, right? Uh, how you can actually accumulate your wealth over the long term. So even with a small amount of uh, 100, S, uh, G, 100 Singapore dollars per month, okay? If uh, let's say I assume a very small percentage of 2% uh, annualized returns, right? You see over a long drawn out course of five years, if I keep putting $100 in my own investments and I let it compound, right? Even in a very low 2% uh, environment, it can actually grow to about six six $6,300 at the end of five years. And then of course, if you increase the returns, you see more. If you increase the, the time horizon, you also see a larger uh, amount. But what, what can you see here? You see that even with a small amount of $100, you can actually potentially grow to quite a substantial amount in the longer term. I mean, who wouldn't want that than just uh, leaving your money in the bank account? Account, right? And then if you see, if I increase the $100 to $500, you see the compounding effect actually goes quite substantially, right? I would say $500 is actually quite a fair amount, right? For a decent individual uh, living in Singapore or anywhere else in the world, right? And of course, if you want to take things up a little notch further, right? With $1,000 of monthly investments, and th once again, think about it as a long-term thing, right? Because when you invest, you're actually investing for yourself. It's not so much of paying uh, a, a phone bill or you know your your utility bills anymore. It's actually you know for your own benefit, right? So you see that with a one thousand dollar monthly RSP, you know let's say in, in one year one thousand times twelve, that's about twelve thousand, right? So twelve thousand in one year, I would say is actually quite a fair you know reasonable amount that you can actually dedicate to for your investing purposes. You see that over five years, you can actually grow it to over sixty three thousand dollars or so, even with a two percent. And this is very being very conservative. I'm I'm using at the lowest uh, 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 rate of return that I can see over here, which is 2%. But you know, if equity markets give us the kind of returns that we want between say 6 to 8% or even 10%, you can see that over five years, your wealth starting, starting small, right, could actually grow uh, quite largely to about over 70K as well. So this is really demonstrating the power of uh, compounding, the power of uh, monthly RSPs and power of discipline when it comes to doing investments, all right? So how do you actually do this uh, when, when you come to building a portfolio? Before I go on to my next topic, which is on the discretionary portfolio management solutions, uh, you know, just want to highlight that when you do an RSP, right, you can invest in almost anything that you, you, you set your sights on. So be it a stock, you know, a, a selected mutual fund or an ETF or even a, a bond fund, for example, you know, um, it depends on what you need and what you, you, you're comfortable with. But for those of you who are you know, pretty much still new to investing, you are not sure on how to you know, create an overall holistic portfolio, right? This discretionary portfolio management solutions is also one of the in-house uh, services that IFAS, we, we over here, we, we provide. So as the name suggests, right, what we call it, uh, it stands for DPMS, so uh, Discretionary Portfolio Management Service. It is basically literally a portfolio management service that we, our in-house uh, portfolio managers uh, help to create for you. Okay, so I'm going to bring you through how we do this, uh, uh, this process. And then uh, after that, we can take some questions if you all have, right? And then uh, this is actually one of the RSPable ideas that you can consider as well. 
All right. So over here, just to introduce our investment philosophy, right? I mean, it's all well and nice to talk about achieving high returns over the long term, but you need a very good process uh, to back you up in the long term as well. So over here at IFAS, what do we believe in? We believe in having sufficient diversification, right? You cannot just buy Singapore stocks, right? I mean, if Singapore goes down and you invest all your money in Singapore, then of course you're also uh, going to suffer. Right. And then a uh, second point here, we believe uh, in investing by fundamentals and valuations. So fundamentals and valuations basically mean we invest in companies that are good companies. We, of course, we would want to invest in companies that are not going to make money for us. Right. So we have our own ways of looking at, at, at the companies over there. And then uh, valuations, meaning to say that we don't want to overpay for anything that it's uh, too expensive. Right. So this is uh, getting more bang for your buck in that sense. Right. So and of course, last point, we have harped on this quite a number of times, we invest it for the long-term view because when you invest, you, you can't just invest for one day, right? If you see that the stock price goes down for one day and you quit, you know, clearly you're setting up yourself for failure because no one invests for even one day unless you're a day trader, right? But when it comes to your long-term uh, uh, wealth planning, your long-term, you know, uh, financial goals, right? It, it, it is uh, at least a long drawn out three to five year kind of uh, horizon depending on individuals. All right, so this is just to set the outset, uh, our own investment philosophies to get you introduced to it. So the way we construct, uh, construct our portfolio, right, it's not done by me. Okay, we have our own uh, in-house experts that help to manage this portfolio, but this is the process uh, essentially that they do. Okay, so we start with asset allocation first. So what is asset allocation? Asset allocation means by, let's take a look at the world map. Where are the areas that, you know, are giving me the returns and where should I avoid? Right. Should I invest more in stocks or should I invest more in bonds? This is the overall, you know, macro uh, kind of outset that the, the fund managers actually, actually start uh, thinking about this when they start doing the construction process. Right. That's the first step. Then the second step, it comes to product selection, right? So once they decide uh, where to invest in the, in the world and where to invest in what kind of products, you're, uh, 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 like, like for example, stocks and bonds, they decide how much already, right? Then they go into the underlying uh, funds or ETFs or, or you know, stocks or, or any other underlying instruments that they think might be good in that sense. So once they set up the portfolio already, they need to review uh, and rebalance it on an ongoing basis, as you can see in uh, the third point. So essentially, this is, a, this is an ongoing repeatable process, you know, uh, it, it's never going to stop at one point. Once I start, and I just leave the portfolio to, 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 to hang there uh, and I'm not going to touch it forever. You know, the third point is actually even more important uh, than the first point because things can change in a matter of just one month. And if we don't review and rebalance the portfolios uh, accordingly, your portfolios will suffer. So this is something that the portfolio managers will be busy doing uh, on a monthly or even a quarterly basis when they review and rebalance the portfolios for you. All right, so this is what, what I was saying in step one, right? They take a look at the world map first. Let's say we start with a very balanced approach if I were to point your attention to the middle bar here. So if given uh, an, uh, uh, a mandate to invest in stocks and bonds, right, which are the two major uh, asset classes in financial markets, stocks and bonds, if let's say I'm equal, you know, I'm equally uh, 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 impartial to either of them. So I take a 50-50 approach, right? That's why I'm balanced. But if let's say I'm a, uh, a more moderately aggressive or an aggressive uh, investor, right? I don't mind taking a little bit more risk. You see that I, I can increase my stock exposure from 50, 70, uh, all the way to 90% maximum, all right? This is just a guideline uh, to let you see uh, how our fund managers are thinking, right? At the same time, if, uh, if, if, the, if, if you are an investor that is a bit more conservative, you don't want to take too much equity risk, right? Then you see that on the left-hand side, you have 90% exposure into the bonds space, you know, if you are super conservative. Or if you want to take a little bit more risk, but not too much, you are somewhere in the middle of uh, conservative and, and balance, which is just moderately conservative, you have 70% into bonds. So this is like the five, you know, typical risk profiles that we have on hand for uh, most of our investors here. Largely, you know, typically people will, uh, will opt for the balanced uh, view. But once again, it, def it depends on your own, uh, uh, your own uh, risk tolerance as well. Okay. But just to give you some new ones in the way we think, right? We also have um, uh, our own flexibility to overweight or underweight wherever, whenever we, we deem fit, right? So if let's say in, in the current situation where stocks are cheap, 
you know, where the global, uh, the, where the global uh, economic outlook is good, right? We can always uh, adopt a higher risk asset allocation towards the stocks market. So you see in the balance just now it was 50-50, right, in the middle. Now it's actually being switched up a notch to about 60-40. Okay, it's very interesting here because it shows that you know our fund managers are actually overweighting uh, an extra ten percent into the stock market space, and then all the way to the right hand side, you see that you know in a kind of situation like that, you're actually taking full equity risk, hundred uh, percent uh, uh, stocks, right? Although we don't have this in our portfolios right now, but this is you know in theory how things can actually uh, go lah. You know, uh, if if let's say our fund manager deems that this is the situation, right? So over here, you see that on the flip side, right, if let's say we are facing a situation where, uh, you know, economic outlook is not too good, you know, things are looking a little bit gloomy, then, you know, fair enough on a balanced, on a balanced uh, uh, view, once again, starting from the middle, instead of taking that overweight into the stocks market, we're actually going to take uh, an overweight into the uh, bonds market. So in the bonds market, we will uh, adopt a... Uh, 60% uh, bonds and 40% uh, uh, stocks instead. So in this case, we're not uh, taking too much risk, right? So you see on the left-hand side in an overall uh, conservative um, um, uh, situation, we have actually 100% uh, bonds instead. So this is just an illustration on how uh, 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 things can actually look like for our fund managers in theory. We're not saying that we'll definitely go, you know, 100% bonds if, 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 uh, if we are conservative, but this is just in theory what the, the mindset is, what the thought process is when it comes to investing uh, in our first step. All right, so after the first step is done, we go into the intra-asset allocation, right? Remember just now we talked about the second step. So the second step actually talks about uh, underlying. So on the equity side, right, typically when you look at um, um, global market indexes like the MSCI All Country Wall, the S&P 500 and all that, you know, they are market cap weighted. What market cap weighted indexes mean is that, you know, they will actually give more weight to companies who are bigger. Right, so all your big companies are like all your US companies like the Facebooks, your Amazons and your Googles, right? So because they are big market cap companies, definitely they'll get more priority in that sense when it comes to being, in, you know, being uh, included into a global stock index like the MSCI uh, All Country World, which I've shown here on the left-hand side. Right, so you can see that by, 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 virtue of this, by virtue of this method, right, a large uh, concentration is actually thrown into US, uh, US markets, which is not going to be very representative if we want to invest globally. Right? I mean, how can the US account for uh, 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 over half of the entire world's uh, economy, correct? I mean, no doubt they are big. Yes, most of the companies there are very important and they're very powerful, but uh, we don't think that this gives you enough diversification because uh, maybe I want to invest in Singapore markets or Chinese markets, not enough uh, exposure in that. So, you know, a typical market cap index uh, wouldn't be too good. So how our uh, fund managers actually do it is this way instead. We actually have an MSCI AC wall GDP weighted index. So you see that the pie chart actually starts to change. Instead of the US taking 50% uh, over of the uh, overall uh, concentration of the index, right? They actually only take up about 25%. And it's just the way, the way our fund managers is looking at this, they actually base it on each country's GDP, uh, GDP amount, right? So they are saying that uh, if, if, if um, you know, if, if each country's Whoever, whoever produces uh, more GDP will get uh, more priority in that sense. So compared to the previous one, you see over here that the US has 53 over percent, right? So in this case, it was whoever is bigger, right? But over here, we adopt a more fair approach to say that whoever produces more in terms of GDP will get uh, the priority here. All right. So in this case, we see that when we adopt the GDP approach, it's more diversified. You get more Asian exposure, you get more European exposure. And we think that, you know, if we adopt this uh, method, it's actually better than, than this uh, over-concentration in US markets uh, over here. All right. Uh, okay. So it has actually been shown that, you know, over time, the GDP weighted index is better than the, um, not say better, but has, 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 has shown to outperform the, uh, the, the, the size weighted uh, index. So you see the light purple line here. This light purple line is the GP weighted one and the dark purple line is the uh, market weighted. So uh, not to say that this trend is going to last for the next uh, 10 years or so, but at least, you know, for the last 20 years, the last two decades, right, the trend has been that 
uh, the GDP weighted has outperformed uh, the uh, market cap weighted indexes. So some of you might uh, disagree, some of you might agree, you know, there are many uh, debates about this, but this is just to illustrate to you that this is the kind of uh, strategy that our fund managers uh, use for our portfolios, right? So this is just to, to kind of summarize uh, what I've been saying. A GDP weighted approach has been what we've been using. And then we say that it's been uh, shown to outperform more than the last two decades. And we think that it gives you a sufficient uh, diversification and gives you a fairer view of uh, the world's economic growth and uh, corporate earnings. All right. So that applies similarly to the bond space. So typically for normal bond indexes, you know, uh, like for example, in this case, the JP Morgan Global Aggregate Bond Index, right? Once again, it's also uh, typically a size priority. Whoever is bigger gets better, more, more uh, weight in the index. So you see here, once again, US is heavily weighted, right? But what we do in that sense, we want to diversify it a little more. So what we have done is we've actually done our own custom uh, bond index where we actually give a more heavy priority to, let's say, Singapore-centric uh, bonds. The reason why we do that is because we prefer their uh, uh, better credit ratings uh, for some of the uh, Singapore issuers. And then, of course, we, we allocate uh, the, the rest accordingly to, to uh, other segments. Uh, like like global bonds or Asian investment grade, you know, or, or the high yields as well, because we think that this provides a little bit more uh, diversification for you in your bonds portfolio. Okay, so once again, you see here that our neutral allocation, the dark purple line, right? At least over the course of the last uh, 20 years or so, it has also significantly out outperformed uh, the, the market cap, uh, the market cap index for the bond space. All right, so with that, after you decide uh, 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 you know, how you want to construct your portfolio, then you have to look at the underlying instruments you use. So right now we are using you know, two things, which is unit trust and ETFs. Right? So unit trust and ETFs, I think some of you might already be familiar with that. Right? For unit trust, it's basically mutual funds and uh, ETFs are the exchange traded uh, funds which try to be passively managed rather than actively managed. So it's a combination of uh, these two things when it comes to constructing the portfolios. But how do we actually do it? So our team looks at this couple of things, right? For unit trust, we of course need to have some form of track record. So we look at the past performance of this fund, whether it's been good, whether it's been delivering very consistent performance over the long term. And of course, expense ratio is also a very important thing because we don't want to uh, overpay, you know, very expensive fund managers. And then this very interesting thing about resilience because, you know, if markets go up and down, right? But when market goes down, we want to see if there is any fund that doesn't go down as much, right? That's called downside capture. We try to reduce the uh, downside capture as much as possible. So when markets go down, we want to be invested in funds or instruments that don't go, don't go down as much. All right, so this is also some of the, just to show you some of the uh, uh, methodologies that go through the minds of our investment managers here. And it's not just all about numbers because if you, as you see here, right, on the qualitative side, they actually also do uh, constantly talk to the uh, fund houses that they invest in. They, they, they ask about, okay, so what's going on with your strategy, whether you're you know, changing your bond space, your fund space, your whatever space. So they actually combine both the quantitative and the qualitative aspects of it together uh, before, they make their, uh, they, before they make their decisions. And the same thing kind of applies to the ETFs as well. So just now we talked about unit trust. So for the ETF space, they look at these three things. All right. So of course you want to have a, a low expense ratio. Once again, we are in a way not trying to uh, uh, give you expensive managers because we believe in low cost as well. And then there's this thing of tracking difference because for ETFs, what is their main uh, job? The main job of ETFs is to replicate the performance of the index, right? So uh, the tracking difference is basically a measure of how much the ETF performance is actually deviating from the underlying index. So of course, a smaller tracking difference is, is highly preferred. And uh, for liquidity, we want to see how, how much liquidity there is for your market. We don't want to you know, be invested in the ETF that is, uh, that is uh, not very liquid, meaning to say that if you want to buy, no one wants to sell to you, right? Or on the flip side, if you want to sell, no one wants to buy from you, right? So that is a measure of liquidity and we want to, uh, we want to be invested in those liquid ones as much as possible. Okay, once again, it's not just about numbers. We also have uh, qualitative criteria where we look at what kind of uh, index we're li looking to uh, uh, replicate. And of course, uh, whether there's over concentration in any one of them or not. 
uh, we try to choose uh, physical ETFs as much as possible because we want to avoid the uh, counterparty risk that is associated when investing with uh, uh, synthetic ETFs. Okay, so this is the uh, rough process that we just talked about inter-asset allocation. We start from the outset, right? Whether it's a 50-50, 60-40, and so on and so forth. Then step two goes into whether funds or ETFs, which ones we are looking at, which fund house, is it, is it a first state or is it a fidelity or is it a PIMCO, right? This is the second step. And then it extends on to the third step as well. Okay, product selection. So, of course, this is the important step that we talked about just now on reviewing and rebalancing. So, the beauty about investing in this uh, DPMS, Discretionary Portfolio uh, Managed Service, right, is that especially for those of you who are very busy in your own daily lives, who don't really have um, much time to, to monitor your own investments, the fund managers actually do this reviewing and rebalancing for you on a monthly basis, and then they will update you uh, very uh, regularly as well on what's going, to, what's going on in the market and what are their strategies going forward. So this is a very, really a very active, uh, you know, uh, management profile and, you know, we will never uh, leave you just hanging there and not doing anything. So you can rest assured that, you know, uh, our fund managers are working, uh, you know, around the clock to, to, to keep you abreast of all the market developments as well. So we like to draw this chart on how they, they actually, um, you know, manage their portfolios. You, you think about it as like managing a soccer field, like a soccer team. Right. You, if you look at us, right, uh, we, we, we need a goalkeeper, we need some defenders, and we need some attackers as well. So definitely for your goalkeeper, you want to have someone that is a very safe position. Right? So we like to put that as yeah, like your uh, Singapore bonds. And then you also need some defenders. Sorry, the thunder is a bit loud. Just give me uh, five seconds. Okay. So for the defenders, you also need some defensive assets to cushion your portfolio against any adverse, uh, adverse market movements, right? So over here, you see that you have some Asian bonds, global bonds exposure. And then at the same time, you also want some people to attack for you, which is why you put a bit of China equity, some technology uh, instruments to actually you know, get, your, get your returns. But this is, also going to, uh, uh, this is also going to expose you to a bit of volatility, right? So... Um, it's very interesting because once you have this layout, right, you look at who is performing, who is not performing. If let's say there is a player that is not performing, what do you do? You change the players, right? So our, our fund managers also have this uh, flexibility to go in and out of uh, whichever fund or fund house that they think is uh, better than the other. So it's not to say that once I select a fund, I have to stay invested in it forever, right? If let's say suddenly the strategy doesn't work anymore, we have the flexibility, uh, you know, to, to actually exit from it, all right? So this is the current asset allocation if in, in our portfolios. We, as you can see, we're quite globally diversified in both uh, the bonds and the, and the equities portion. The very interesting thing is that you see I've just uh, charted out a red, red color box at the bottom. We actually just crafted out an extra 10% uh, allocation to the digital economy space, right? So in most of our portfolios, we currently have a 10% allocation to the digital economy and we'll tell you why uh, this is the case, right? So why is, why is the digital economy so, so important that we can't um, avoid it, right? So just now remember when we talked about GDP uh, weighted methodology, right? It only shows um, uh, on, a, on a regional geographical basis. That means I'm only looking at countries, but I'm not looking at sector specific. So the digital economy is not a country in itself, right? but uh, we actually look at sector specific. So digital economy is a sector and it's actually making about 10% uh, allocation in the global portfolio. So, so we find that it is actually too big to ignore this sector. As you see that all the underlying sec sub sectors are like your e-commerce, your, you know, your e-services and so on. So all your companies like your Alibaba's and you know, all these Amazons, all these companies are going to form you know, the, the backdrop of this digital economy space. And we believe that this is going to be the case for the next few years going ahead because this is the in thing now, right? So aside from that, you also have fintech and digital advertising in the cloud space. So Microsoft is a very big player in the cloud space, for example. So you see all these sectors, they actually make up about, you know, about close to 10% of the global economy, just to give you some illustration. The global economy is about, you know, 86.6 uh, trillion. And then the uh, uh, size of the digital economy is about 9.35. So this is about 10 plus 10-ish percent of the entire uh, uh, global economy space. Right, and the way that we've uh, 
incorporated that into our portfolios is via this ETF known as the OShares Global Internet ETF. So you see that this ETF actually captures, all, as you can see on the right hand side, all the major players that you know I was talking about just now, be it your Amazons, your you know your your Google's Alphabet's Alibaba, and there's also Facebook inside. So all these are the companies that we believe is you know is going to have a very good uh, outlook going forward. And 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 you know we have actually invested this. Uh, invested in it via these uh, OShares Global Internet Giants ETF. All right, so you see at the left hand side the expense ratio is 0.48%. Right, so this once again emphasizes our point about having a low cost management fees. All right, and uh, one more, one more, just to share with you, one more uh, additional allocation would be uh, the US high yield bond space. Initially, if you see right. Uh, in this red box that I've, I have uh, drawn out here, we are still underweight uh, the uh, US high yield bond space, right? As you can see that neutrally, actually it's 15%, but right now we are 12.5%. We are still underweight, but you see a bracket plus 2.5% beside it, right? The reason for that is because even before this uh, uh, period, we were actually only holding 10% in global US high yield bonds, right? But only recently we added an additional 2.5% to it to make it 12.5%. So I'm going to run you through very quickly on why we thought that is the case. So for those of you who are very uh, akin to the US high yield credit space, we see that you know US high yield credit spaces have kind of widened by quite a fair bit in this uh, recent period because of the virus situation, right? You draw that back all the way to 2008, 2009 during the great financial crisis. It's not as high as back then, but of course, we definitely still see that it's uh, reasonably high, right? And you see that but on a historical average basis, right, over the last 15 years or so, the default rate has been about roughly about 3%. So uh, right now, you know, uh, the, the default rate for 2020 is largely the same as what we saw in the recession. Right, whether it goes up or goes down, uh, it, it still largely remains to be seen. But, but you know, based on this, we think that because the credit spreads have widened, we think that there is a lot of uh, opportunities for, for this uh, mispricing to be captured upon as well. That's why we recently overweighted it. Okay, and then uh, the reason why we think that is because you see the maturity for the debts, right? They are not, it's not that they are all maturing in the next one or two years. You see that they're quite largely spread out towards the longer term, three to five years, five to seven years, and so on. So we believe that actually that gives them a bit of more time to refinance their debts. You know, all these companies refinance their debts or at least take a, a few more years to have enough cash positions to eventually pay down their debts. So we're actually very confident that, you know, the longer term, this, uh, this space will start to recover and that's why we have started to put a little bit more into the US high use space. Some of you might be uh, concerned about the energy sector that you know this forms a lot of uh, uh, a major part of the US high use sector but you can see that back in uh, five years six years ago this could have been the case with the energy sector being uh, about close to 15 percent but this is actually halved in the last six years to only about seven percent uh, of the US high yield sector. So we believe that, you know, even if a lot of the energy related or related companies uh, get defaulted, right, uh, the impacts on the overall sector wouldn't be too much. Okay, so just to give you a, a rough um, gauge, this is the performance of, of our portfolios uh, as of end March. So definitely, you see on a year to date basis, as, as you know, everybody was taking a big hit, right? So our portfolios were not spared as well. Right, but you can see that on an inception basis, uh, since inception, right, since we, we actually started at the uh, uh, when Donald Trump got elected, right, so that was actually back in December 2016. You can see that if you had invested uh, back then and all the way until today, you would still be reaping uh, close to positive returns for most of the portfolios on an annualized basis. Right. So if this, uh, if this drawdown didn't happen, if this virus situation would, didn't happen, right, of course, our portfolios would have also uh, done a little bit better. But of course, because everyone got indiscriminately sold off in the past month or so, uh, even our portfolios were not spared. Okay. And then as you can see, but just now we talked about being balanced on a 50-50 basis, right, and the importance of being globally diversified. The balanced portfolio actually exposes you to quite a fair wide variety of uh, uh, spaces. So you're, so you're not overly concentrated into any one sector uh, in your entire portfolio per se, right? And then uh, depending on where you want to invest, you can, or rather depending on your own risk profiles, if you are more conservative, you can opt for the income portfolio, right? Or if you're more aggressive, you can opt for the more uh, capital accumulation, capital growth portfolios, which have a bit more in the equity space. Okay, but of course that also subjects you to a bit more risk.
All right, so uh, I think that's all I have uh, to share about uh, this idea. Once again, this DPMS discretionary portfolio management service, right? It is also a uh, an idea that you can consider putting your RSP monies inside. So I think the minimum amount right now is only about hundred dollars uh, uh, to start investing in this globally diversified portfolio. So think about it of investing in a long term. You know, each each month you just uh, invest about hundred dollars, and if you draw it out over the longer term, all these market returns will be delivered for you uh, in the longer term. All right. So um, I, I think that's all I have. Uh, if you have any questions, um, okay, I'm going to, yeah. If you have any questions, please uh, key them down in the Q&A uh, portion below. So I have a first question which shows why are all the portfolios since inception returns lower than their benchmark? Uh, so this is a very common question. So I'm going to show you this again, this chart. You see that I've also highlighted a red box here, right? So when people ask me what is the benchmark, the benchmark is the composite benchmark of the MSCI world for equity proportion and the Bloomberg Barclays Global Aggregate Bond Index for the bond proportion. So remember just now we talked about uh, market cap weighted index and the uh, uh, GDP weighted index. So the benchmark we are using is actually just a, 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 a gauge to see how we compare against the market cap indexes. In that sense, we can't really compare our own performance to that of the MSCI AC or the Bloomberg Barclays because you know it's like comparing apples on apples and oranges, right? Definitely, when you when you use the MSCI AC world because you are using a lot of US uh, uh, US uh, 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 exposure there, right? Maybe you'll see a bit of differences in the performance. But because our portfolios are built on the GDP weighted basis, so you can't really say that it's a like for like comparison. We put the benchmark figures there just for a for a by the way kind of comparison basis to see how we are performing against uh, the um, the uh, what do you call that uh, benchmarks for the. Uh, 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 market cap weighted basis, but I think what you should be paying attention to would be the value strategies that our our portfolio managers are actually adopting to. All right. So thank you, Dylan, for sharing all these uh, information about RSPs and about DPMS. So um, let me just share again and highlight about um, what we are here today. Let me share the slides again. Okay, so I guess let me re-emphasize on what IFAS Global Market can do for you. Okay, so we are basically an all-in-one platform. We have Unitrust, ETF, bonds, and stocks. And we are able to provide strong support. So me as an investment advisor, I'm able to be the bridge to help you get into all the investment products that you would like to get into. And we are able to have flexibility in investment. We have a mobile app and it will allow you to trade easily on, on the go. And it is 24-7 and we have 24-7 hotline. So you can just call in and if there's any issue, you can the, the hotline will actually answer back to you also. Okay. So how do you start investing? Basically, there is two sorts of account. The first is a DIY account and secondly, there is the advisor assistant account which is under me. Okay. So do download the IGM app, regardless of whether you are the DIY user or um, advisor assistant account. Okay, register yourself with triple zero three seven and do send me a message to let me know that you have created an account. Okay, so that I can help you adjust the fees because once you download the account and you do a registration, there will be a default fees. But not to worry, I will amend accordingly to um uh, a custom for you. Okay, and then you can select the funds that you would like to purchase or the DPMS. Um, that is Dylan has been talking about for the whole 45 minutes. Um, then you can just basically set up a gyro account and you're good to go. Okay, so you just have to decide on what is your time horizon, what is your risk portfolio that you are going to um, take on and just let the time help you invest. Okay, and for advisor assisted account, basically I'll give you a more personalized portfolio. Um, it will be based on the amount of investment that you are able to put in and then we will set up a uh, gyro accordingly as well. Okay. So the IGM app basically um, the RSP start from as low as 0 0.38. So that's basically for the DIY portions. So what you can do is just go to your uh, Google Play or your App Store. Just search IGM and you should be able to find um, our app. So there's another app called iFast. That's our old app. So 
do download the new one, which is IGM. Okay, and just download and uh, register an account and indicate my code, and I'll be able to assist you accordingly. Okay, so do contact me if you have any other queries. Uh, my e this is my email norman.b at ipassgm.com, and this is my contact number. And we are actually located at Raffles Place Ocean Financial Center, 10 quality. Okay, so if there's uh, right now because yeah. of COVID situation, of course, not advisable for you to come down. Um, so we will do uh, any meetups via Zoom uh, for this entire month. Dylan, you got anything yeah, there else? is a, there's one question uh, from one of our attendees, uh, I believe uh, from, from Samuel Fong. He's asking uh, how I hedge USD exposure. So uh, this one depends on the, on the uh, discretion of the fund manager. So if we think that uh, for a particular fund, right, uh, um, if, if let's say it has a SGD share class or a USD share class, right, we'll think about whether the underlying securities are uh, denominator in USD or SGD as well. But if let's say we don't want to take any currency risk, uh, we will actually just invest in let's say the SGD hedged uh, uh, fund share class. So essentially when you invest your monies in SGD, right, we will take your SGs and just buy uh, the SGD hedged uh, share class option so, so we don't take any FX risk uh, in that sense. So I think most of our funds are uh, SGD based already, but then if let's say there is a USD option and we believe that uh, uh, that's the only way to go, then we'll, we'll, we'll still invest in the USD option. All right. Thank you, Dylan. So if there's any question, you can just drop me a message and I'll answer you accordingly as well. Okay, so thank you for joining us today. Uh, this will be the end. Thank you.